Our next speaker is Dr. Stephanie Bird. Dr. Bird is a laboratory trained neuroscientist whose professional interests are twofold. The ethical, legal, and social policy implications of scientific research, especially in neuroscience, and education in the responsible conduct of research and the professional responsibilities of scientists and engineers. She is also an independent consultant and co-editor-in-chief of Science and Engineering Ethics, which is an international publication that explores ethical issues of concern to scientists and engineers. Please welcome Dr. Stephanie Bird. Thank you all. It's a real pleasure to be here. I, was, I really appreciate uh, and thank you for inviting me to participate in this discussion with all of you and with my colleagues, um, all of you as my colleagues. Um, this is a very interesting topic, and it runs as you hear, and we'll hear more of, uh, the gamut of, of uh, consensus from not in total agreement to in shared view. So, um, let me say <clears throat> that a few years ago, um, I, I do a number of uh, responsible conduct and research workshops and uh, summer cor and courses uh, at MIT, where I was the special assistant to the provost for quite a while. And um, so I was doing a session for summer students, for undergraduate students that were working at MIT. And the topic was a discussion about authorship. And in the course of the discussion, one of the students raised this question. She said, uh, why does it matter who gets credit? Isn't the quality of the science what's really important? So at some level, of course, that is the point, isn't it? Um, what is it that we are all doing here? Isn't the science, the reliability of it, the accuracy of it, the dependability of it, what is essential? Um, but in our society, and in turn in the US research university, who gets credit for um, one set of reliable science, re reliable work, is taken as a measure of who can be expected to be doing good science in the future, and therefore, who should be given the finite resources and uh, who can compete uh, for the, the funds that uh, in a society where you have competing interests and competing concerns, um, who is it that we're going to give the money to? And also, who deserves the recognition? So at some level, we've taken as a marker of the, of the quality of the science that you can be expecting to get, um, who's done it in the past. And that seems to work pretty well. And I think that her question leads me, leads us, I think, to pause and to consider some of the first principles. What is it that we're doing here in terms of science? What is your role? What's all of our, each of us has a role in the whole process of developing science, spending human resources on that, as opposed to some other things we could be spending resources on. So I'd like to kind of highlight some, what I think of our first principles that I'm hoping will not be controversial, um, and then see how that relates to our discussion about plagiarism and um, uh, two particular topics before we actually um, begin an interactive discussion with all of you and with uh, the, uh, all of you with and among the, uh, uh, the panelists. So among the fundamental concepts or first principles that I'd like to highlight, um, one is that science builds on previous work, researchers depend on the work of others, and that means that this doesn't seem too controversial to me. Uh, researchers, and as a former lab researcher myself, I can say that you pretty much count on the quality of the work that you uh, see in the literature. You don't really want to be reinventing the wheel all of the time. Um, the, and I think, um, as I think it was uh, uh, Dr. Kroll pointed out, uh, you won't get much funding for repeating previous work. So we're counting on being able to build on the work that's out there. Uh, second of all, inherent in this concept of 
building on others' work is dissemination. We are assuming that people take what they do and then they share it with everybody else. They don't write it down in a little notebook and then stick it in a secret place that doesn't go out there for other people. So that means that uh, dissemination is really a critical, essential part of science now. It's not the 1800s where we just go and talk in a little secret, or maybe not so secret, the Royal Society, I suppose, wasn't secret, but it is a place where uh, we actually disseminate our information and the written word is um, as important, if not more important, I would say more important than um, the presentations, oral presentations. Um, so authorship is the coin of the realm. This is basically what we use as the way that we communicate our information. Uh, but authorship confers credit and responsibility. And it's those two elements that need to be equally highlighted. Often in discussions about authorship, what gets focused on is the credit and who gets credit for it. But in fact, we need to also recognize that the responsibility part of it is just as important. So other researchers must be able to rely on the science and the credibility of the work is limited and linked to and by, or by and to, the reputation of the researcher. That is, to a great extent, whether or not people uh, believe the science and, and feel comfortable building on it depends upon what they know about the researcher and the foundation that that person has laid. And often that is um, based upon their reputation and the work that they've done in the past. Certainly, um, when you submit a proposal, part of what um, is considered is whether or not the proposal demonstrates the capability of doing additional further research. So this all relates to our discussion here about plagiarism. But un inherent and perhaps implicit and too often not explicit about the point of dissemination is in fact that the goal is communication. That is, the goal of the written word is to make clear to a second party what it is that the first party is actually trying to convey. And that isn't always obvious and it's not always simple. Uh, for people who don't speak the same language, that can be really challenging. Even for people who think they do speak the same language, that can be really challenging. So I think it's very important that we keep in mind and in, uh, in the forefront that what we're looking for is an interactive, usually iterative, in some, to some extent, process. And that is usually not possible, because if you have a written word, rarely do people write back. Basically, it's a matter of making sure as clearly as possible that you've communicated the ideas that you uh, uh, want to convey. And there is a, this is a team process in some sense. That is, the author or authors work with an editor, hopefully. The editor works also uh, on trying to make sure that what they expected readership is going to be getting is actually a reasonable representation of what the author has in mind. So, and I think another perhaps fundamental assumption, first principle, is that um, individuals deserve recognition for their significant, important contributions to a field, to an idea, um, to a concept. Um, so with these things in mind, I'd like to consider two topics. Uh, I'm sure we'll consider more of them, but uh, the two that I would like to touch on are uh, this one about self-plagiarism, and also uh, the idea of um, the plagiarism of ideas. So let me just start off by saying that the term self-plagiarism is to me like fingernails on a chalkboard. And so um, I was pretty feisty after um, uh, Miguel's talk, but I'm feeling better now. And <laughs> So I probably will not be using the term per se, but, um, but we know what we're talking about here, or at least I'm going to be spelling out what I'm talking about here. So um, it is pretty much, uh, I would say, and I'm at the other end of the continu continuum from Miguel, I would say that it is essentially a non-entity, since I agree with the common definition that plagiarism is uh, the process of 
appropriation of another person's ideas, processes, results, or words without giving appropriate credit. Um, but issues arise that is, in particular, the issues around dual publication and redundant publication and salami publication, or however what you want to group these things, um, because of the secondary effect of the fact that the research community uses authorship as a measure of an individual's contribution and hence their value to the research process. So it serves as the basis for hiring, promotion, tenure, it serves as the basis for funding. And too often, that process happens because, um, uh, or that happens by way of, not because, but uh, by way of taking a stock of the number of publications that someone has put out the number of first authorships, the number of authorships that someone has on their CV, rather than an actual evaluation of the contribution itself. So, um, for dual publication, some article that I'm taking that to mean the same publication or triplicate publication or quadruplicate, it's the same exact article in more than one place. And, um, Sometimes, not to, well, in any case, sometimes this happens um, because authors find uh, that the publishing process itself is too cumbersome and it's really slow and they have need of getting a publication out. So they'll send the same article to more than one place, not sure who or whether uh, or when it will actually appear in publication. And the goal is to get this out because I need it in order to be, put it on my application because otherwise um, I won't get tenure or I won't get promoted or whatever. And so, the, as we all know, the publishing process is quite variable. I can speak from first-hand knowledge about that. Um, and so it's very much dependent on the review process and the way in which um, volunteers, that is reviewers, or, re or um, perhaps coerced volunteers, people who have been requested to review a paper, uh, the speed w with which they turn that around. So it doesn't happen necessarily in the time frame or perhaps consistent with the temperament of authors, and therefore they may uh, uh, foolishly decide to submit the same paper to more than one journal, hoping that it will appear in one or the other, and maybe they'll withdraw it from the second one once they hear back from the first one that gets back to them first. It's kind of like college. And so they want to uh, get uh, this into the system as soon as possible. Um, and so if they haven't if they've got a favorite choice, but it doesn't appear there as rapidly then as they would like, then they may think that they will withdraw it. Of course, it's um, similarly foolish because, uh, has been pointed out, it is a small, small world, and often the same person will be asked to review both submissions, um, which certainly lets the cat out of the bag and makes editors quite aggravated uh, because, it is a, uh, an example of the misuse and mis, uh, mis um, and the lack of respect for the, the amount of time that these volunteers are submitting to the process. That is the reviewers and often the editors. Um, but I think that um, not to excuse it, but this is one of the things that happens. And unfortunately, uh, members of the community who do these dual submissions um, are foolish enough to not recognize that this is part of being a member of the community and a part of the system. Uh, redundant publication is the reuse of some uh, or all of the data that was previously uh, presented, previously published, pe previously uh, made public in some way, form or another. Um, this in, sometimes is the result as the discussion about the salami publications, what was once upon a time noticed, uh, noted as uh, the least publishable unit or LPUs. Um, the whole idea was that you could get more bang for your buck and part of it was that you could just put these out in little bits 
um, and get a lot of publications, but it was also a recognition of the fact that some journals were uh, very reluctant to uh, publish longer articles. They had a lot of people lined up who wanted to get their papers out there, and they did not want to take the space to, uh, to put the larger article that put all the ideas together. Personally, my preference is to have everything in one place so that you can see how the pieces fit together. And that's clearly uh, uh, beneficial, most beneficial to the reader rather than to have go and dig it up in a few different places. And that's also more uh, effective for the intellectual process of understanding what's going on. Um, but notice that this is a publisher generated or, and to some extent um, kicking and dragging an editor's responsibility as well. Uh, and the authors, you know, the members of the research community are responding to uh, something that was not their first choice. Um, but also, this uh, can be, alternatively, a way to work the system. That is, a way to generate a larger number of publications and give the impression that one is uh, really prolific, especially if the people on the P and, uh, pr Promotion and Tenure Committee are only counting the number of publications and not how long they are or how they fit together uh, or actually bring them together. And one can certainly ask, well, why wouldn't a person who's charged to really give serious consideration to promotion and tenure and professional advancement in general. Why wouldn't they take the time to go and get all these articles and read all these articles and see whether or not and to what extent this person has put these ideas together? Well, probably because um, like most committees, there's a lot of time involved with this and not surprisingly, I'm sure to most faculty here and probably most administrators, and sooner or later, all of you students, um, there is a huge number of voluntary um, expectations that come with being on, a being on the faculty of any institution. And uh, beyond teaching and super supervising research and generating proposals and writing papers, and we could go on for a while, um, there are the committee responsibilities and the review responsibilities of articles. And so people will often take the shortcut that they have been led to believe is accurate, that is the number of papers that one is an author to, is a measure of your contribution to the field and therefore your appropriateness for considering to, uh, professional advancement. So at some level we see that the way the system is laid out, we've got one volunteer set and another volunteer set of people who often are the same overlapping set of people, but the result is that people will learn, figure out how to game the system in order to get the impression, or create the impression, that they're incredibly prolific and invaluable components of the uh, research community and therefore merit advancement. Um, so this is not to say, let me be clear, but this is not to say that dual our redundant publication uh, uh, isn't unacceptable, or no, isn't on the continuum from preferred practice to unacceptable practice closer to this end, that is to the discouraged level, than to the preferred and encouraged practice. But there are certainly exceptions, and it's the exceptions that we need to take consideration of, that is, each case and each situation merits uh, further um, and perhaps in-depth consideration. So it certainly is the case that if one person decides that they're going to submit this paper to five different places, they get five different publications, and there's nothing different about it except either the order of the authors or the and or the uh, particular title, um, then that's definitely something that we would, I think, as a community, consider unacceptable. Uh, at least because of the, t the amount of time and effort that it wastes on the part of the people who volunteer their time to uh, make the uh, research community work. Um, but on the other end of the continuum, uh, when we talk about redundant publications where you have pieces put together and, they're put, uh, and you have a publication that consists of um, perhaps uh, a presentation of one's work and, in addition, uh, an editor 
or a group of colleagues are putting together an edited volume that's a collection of the state of the art uh, in that particular field, and they especially ask an author to provide uh, that paper or a version, an updated version of that paper that is very much the same information, but because they're trying to put together a collection that uh, can put in one place, in one volume, a number of important papers uh, that are not exactly the things that were published 10 years ago or five years ago, but are um, uh, available for example, to trainees, then it's uh, not entirely, uh, um, it's not the worst possible thing for the community because what we're trying to do is to communicate the ideas, that is to get the information together and to make it available as much as possible to the community as a whole. Um, let's see. Hmm. So I think that we, what we want to do um, is recognize that when we talk about redundant publication, we can uh, be including in that, inappropriately, um, papers that are written for different audiences and or that are written using the same information but presenting it differently because the readership is different. And the audiences may include policymakers. It may into, include the general public. It may include researchers in one specialty as opposed to researchers in a different specialty for whom the paper was originally, the data was originally gathered. When you have, for example, in my field, neuroscience, when you bring together behaviorists and molecular geneticists, um, they don't necessarily write in the same jargon for the same people. And it's really uh, critically important if you believe that providing information and le that lays a solid foundation for other work in different disciplines is important, then you believe that it's important to make sure that the ideas are adequately conveyed in language and in a process that makes clear to different populations the same information that will be useful to them. And let me just reiterate that I am of the school that believes that um, it is really important, critically important, that, that researchers either be able to or make sure that information that can and often does and perhaps should serve as the foundation for public policy is conveyed adequately to policy makers who aren't necessarily scientists in their background. So I think that this is a really important role and it's not trivial to do that. That is, it's, as I'm sure you all recognize, communicating to a population that you're not used to communicating with is really um, an important service that is very time consuming. But it can be based upon the exact same data that was the foundation for other papers. So we need to really consider what it is that we're specifically looking at in different situations. All of these particular L, um, entities um, documents are aimed at increasing dissemination and we don't need to be, I think, we need to be careful not to be too quick to denigrate the contributions and minimize the, the challenge that, that these entail. Um, I could say some other things about self-plagiarism as a copyright issue, um, but I think that uh, for the same reason that Miguel said we want, I'd rather focus on the issues, the underlying issues, rather than the legal aspects of it. Although I have to say, in spite of being an editor for a journal, that uh, I'm not always convinced that the publishing community is as in tune with the needs of the research community that it is presumably serving and relying on uh, when it comes to um, having policies and uh, practices that make the best use of the uh, contributors, that is the authors and the editors, uh, compared with um, what's their, their uh, bottom line financial concerns. Um, so let me just touch on, before we get on to our interactive discussion, because I think we only have five minutes, right, good, okay. Um, so I just want to touch on the idea of plagiarism of ideas. Um, so unlike words and methods and processes, uh, the uh, 
plagiarism of ideas can be a very difficult um, and perhaps um, uh, slippery uh, concept. Uh, when I have done the re uh, responsible conduct of research workshops, I have often used a scenario called Tenure Track that was written by my colleague Eve Nichols when she was at the uh, Whitehead Institute with some of her colleagues there. And it deals with the plagiarism of ideas uh, or of the concept. Um, and in this particular scenario, even the perpetrator thinks um, he might actually be guilty of stealing an important idea from a colleague, even though he doesn't remember ever discussing the topic with her or uh, having her discuss the topic with him. And I f found it a valuable the scenario, a valuable teaching tool, because it highlights some realities. Um, that is, the source of an idea can be pretty slippery. Trainees actually may not recognize that their new idea or their new insight is actually the result of some effective Socratic teaching that's aimed at drawing out of the student and having them grasp an idea as their own that is fundamentally getting it um, in the process of, a lear of learning. And that's, I think, some of the best kind of teaching. But it certainly does lead to some contentions where I've heard students think, well, that was my idea, when in fact it was actually built on a foundation, a model that has been in that research group, for example, for a while. Um, I think it's also the case that um, in a research community that's very interconnected, no matter what, how, but however interconnected this one is, and we know that no matter which community we're talking about, whether it's physicists, you know, uh, fusion physicists or um, molecular geneticists, there is a great deal of interconnection. People have the same background, they have often the same training, they go to the same lectures, they read the same journals, they exchange students. And so, being able to say that this is actually uh, an idea that I've had and that no one else could possibly have come up with the idea, this idea independently without having listened to me and taken the idea from me is a little bit disingenuous. It's um, uh, something that's not really reasonable to expect of humans. And of course, uh, just like uh, first-hand uh, accounts of situations, the memory is not reliable. And we need to kind of get past that um, because that's a fallacy that's out there and that creates a lot of problems for us as a, as a society, as a humanity, as a species. Um, and so I think that, that this particular scenario has been extremely helpful in getting the students to kind of think about, well, where do ideas come from? And can I really claim that this idea is unique to me? And sometimes it is. And I don't um, discount in any way that um, when individuals have really unique, extraordinary insights into something, that it's, a, that it's uh, always valuable to give them um, recognition. And, but we also see that Nobel committees often have a hard time deciding who it is that ought to get the, the prize. And that remains sometimes an interactive uh, controversy uh, within the, the research community itself, no matter what the field. So um, remembering that memory is fallible, I think, is an important part of it. Um, and it does happen um, that people do steal other people's ideas. And, uh, I think that we need to recognize that there's a range of possibility and to consider individual situations. So I think, in conclusion, I'd like to say that uh, in thinking about what it is we're trying to accomplish, I really want to underscore the importance of communication uh, and the complexity of doing that. It's not simple, and it, we need to recognize that um, the science shows that people are only capable of learning about three to five new things at a time. And so expecting people to really remember everything that they've learned before and then to uh, run off and build on top of that um, is, is not a, a, a useful expectation of the readership as a whole. So we need to recognize where it is that um, Having written something before, I can assume that you have it and therefore will um, know it and I don't need to uh, re-explain it or explain it in a different way. <laughs>